First John chapter 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the, the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is the word of the Lord. So let's pray. Jesus, what a special morning this is for a whole host of reasons, but in particular for two. One, because you are with us. You have gathered in our midst. Like we prayed earlier today, you have been here long before anybody stepped in this building or even woke up this morning, and you will be with us long after we leave or log off. So thank you. Jesus, we thank you for an opportunity and a time to worship you, to praise you, to feel our hearts and our burdens lifted up in your presence. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning that will strengthen us, embolden us, equip us, comfort us. And Jesus, we thank you for our moms. Biological, two or three generations removed, spiritual, adoptive, foster, stand-ins, and any and every other category I may have missed. Lord, we thank you for our moms. Not only for what they do, because they are not just what they do, but for who they are. For the special people they are and that you make them to be. What a blessing they are to us. What a blessing we do not deserve, but you have given us them. So would we cherish and love them today? Jesus, we ask and pray for all these things in your matchless name. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. So one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's like it. If you have not been tuned in lately or have been with us, you do not know that we have been in 1 John. And now you know. We're in 1 John, and we're calling this sermon series The Way of Love. John, the apostle writing this letter, writes in a time that is very iffy in church life. They have survived the pandemic. He sees a pandemic coming. And like we're going to talk about a little bit today, there's actually people in the church or claiming to be in the church who want to add on to the gospel, who want to say their words match the words of Jesus, which causes a whole bunch of chaos. And so he writes this letter reminding us, instructing us, equipping us, encouraging us, showing us the way that Jesus walked, which is the way of love, that we constantly need to learn and relearn and relearn. Here's what we've talked about so far. God is life, and in him only life is found. Apart from him, there is no life. You won't find it. But God is also light. In him there is no darkness, there is no shame, there is no guilt. There's no condemnation because of Jesus. We talked about how Jesus is our advocate, fighting on our behalf long before we think to even ask for it or even believe that he would do so. And last week we looked at how do we love others like Christ loves us in community through obedience and through asking and seeing. Asking, how does Jesus see these people? And Jesus, how do you want me to see these people? And this is our sermon for today. A warning and a promise. If you were paying attention, and you hopefully were when I read the sermon text, you would realize that, like some of the other passages we've gone through so far in this book, there's a lot of uh, heaviness to it. There's a lot that you read it at first glimpse, and you're like, I should probably take this serious. This seems like something that I don't want to skim over. In particular, this morning, John... In his capacity as an apostle, as a, in his capacity as a leader over the church, trying to emulate his God, his Savior, loving the flock in a tender way, writes to them, writes to us, a warning, but also a promise. And we're going to get to that in that order. Now, if you hear the word warning and you think, ugh, I'm with you. I don't particularly like the word warning either. But believe it or not, the older we get, or at least the older I get, we realize that warnings, whether we necessarily like them or not, are not entirely awful. 
they're usually for our good. When you start to drive, and it's the green light ahead of you on the stoplight, and it starts to turn yellow, outside of whatever else you may do or think, you know instinctively, slow down. A red light is coming. We call that the caution light. Caution's another word for warning. But there's plenty of examples like that. For any and every one of us to have a laptop, a phone, a gaming device, anything you can think of, most of them, unless they're plugged in directly to the wall, will at some point give you a chime or a notification that says, low battery. That's a warning. That's telling you, plug me in or change my batteries or else I'm dying and you can't use me anymore. Which, I don't think any of us want that, right? So warnings are abundant in our world. They're everywhere. And warnings exist, at least in the biblical sense, not as a reaction, but proactive. You see, even though there was a lot of chaos going on in the church right now because of a lot of different circumstances we've talked about in the past weeks, the faith of the readers of John's letter are actually in a pretty decent spot. They're trusting God. They're following Jesus, even with persecution and chaos and all this kind of stuff happening around them. They're trusting that he is who he says he is. And so we see that John's warning is not a reaction against all oh, them messing up or them going astray or all that kind of jazz. It's proactive. He's begging them to be cautious about the dangers that are coming and also the dangers that have been around forever since Genesis 3. So we're going to get into those this morning. But in order to understand what the warning and the promise is actually about, we need to understand a word or a term that shows up a lot in those scripture passages I've just read, and it's the world. What is the world? Most of us think, okay, if I go outside and I see some plants and some trees, a bird, that's the world. And you would be right, technically, but that's not the way John's talking about it. You would think people, right? Humankind in general, the people in your life, the people around your life. Sure, that's the world, but that's not what John's talking about. In this passage, John is referencing a very, very specific idea that we need to latch on to and understand if we're going to understand his warning and his promise. And the world is this. It's a system. It's a system that came into being all the way back in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve ate the fruit. It's a system that was birthed by sin, fueled by sin, governed by Satan. And it's a system that exists in any, in any number of forms and different ways in and around us that is constantly dragging our attention, our allegiance to something that is not God. It's hostile. It's antagonistic. It is against God. And so if you think back to the passage, you can see why he says, don't love the world or the things of the world. He has strong language about the world because the world has very strong opinions for us and about God. And they're not good. So keep that in mind. The world, this system. In John, 1 John 5, 19, Jesus says, not Jesus, John, later on in this very letter that we're reading, says this. We know that we are from God, and the whole world, same context, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Jesus says this, recorded in John 15. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We see both the author of our text this morning and Jesus himself speak to this idea that the Father and the world are literally worlds apart. Pun intended. They have everything to do with each other, but nothing to do with the same agenda. The same desires for us, for creation as we understand it. The warning this morning comes in three parts. We're going to break it down. This is part one. You can't love the world and the Father at the same time. Jesus and John in those verses we just read make that pretty clear. But even if that's not enough, there's a logical way to think about this. We as beings were created with a capacity for certain things. We can only handle so much pain, so much suffering, so much emotion, so much thoughts, even relationships. We can only handle a certain amount of relationships, believe it or not. But that very same idea applies to the fact when we talk about love. And when I mean love, I don't mean the emotion. 
Because usually when we say love, the emotion, we're really talking about happiness or some kind of fulfillment. Love in this context, in this passage, is talking about this idea of commitment. Of every day waking up and choosing it whether you feel like it or not. And so we really only have room in our tanks, room in our very souls, for one kind of commitment like that. Either the world or the Father. We don't have room for both. If you can imagine a t-shirt dunked in a bucket full of water, left in there to soak. When you pull it out, it would be dripping. And then if you try to take that very same t-shirt and you dump it in a bucket of oil, you know what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing's going to happen. You're going to pull out that t-shirt out of the bucket of oil as wet as it was before because it literally has no room. That's us. We have enough love, enough commitment that the kind we're talking about in today's passage for one, just one. And we really only have two choices, the world or the Father. That's it. But can loving the world really be that bad? Can't I have my cake and eat it too? Part two. The world's blank is not from God. I'll read the rest in a second, but let's get into this for a moment. You can fill in that blank with whatever you want. The passage we read today uses the word desires. But you can fill that in with whatever you want. Influences, goals, attitudes, postures, hopes and dreams. It's not from God. They're not. We've talked about this. That's what John 15 said. That's what 1 John 5, 19 says. That's what John flat out says in verse 16. The things of the world are not from the Father. It seems very basic, right? John's like pretty much making like a straight argument here. No hiccups, no kind of like read between the lines kind of nonsense going on. But here's, here's the thing that we always miss or we wrestle with or quite frankly, like sometimes in my life, I just don't want to deal with. If they're not from God, it's not good. Which kind of seems like a duh moment. But if it's not from God, it's not good. My mother knows I'm going to tell this story. <laughs> if she doesn't, she didn't read my text yesterday. <laughs> so, mommy, if you're watching, <laughs> here we go. My mother and I have lived very different lives. When we were 22 at our respective 22s, I was getting married and she was figuring out how to come to America and then came to America on a boat, literally pursuing the American dream. Very different worlds, literally worlds apart, pun intended. My mother is a feisty lady. My mother is a very passionate woman. My mother sometimes likes to talk about things she doesn't know anything about. I love you, Mom. I get this from her. I promise you, I'm not going to bash my mother on Mother's Day. I promise you. My mother and I like to have conversations every so often about things we both fully recognize we know nothing about. Just to see if we can convince the other person we know something about that thing. It's ludicrous. It's, 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 it drives people up a wall when they watch it, and it's so much fun. But if you were to ask my mom about rocket science, my mom could teach you absolutely nothing about rocket science. And it has nothing to do with her intelligence. It has nothing to do with her capacity to hold an argument or to debate or to have an actual conversation with you. That has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the fact that my mom knows absolutely nothing about rocket science. The world knows absolutely nothing about anything that is good. So how can we possibly expect to receive good things from a world that knows nothing of good? I can't go to my mom and ask her to help me build a car. That would literally take forever and we would never get it done. Mostly because neither one of us know anything about cars. We can't go to the world, which is not from God. We've seen this. That's part one. They're worlds apart. We can't go to the world and expect to receive good things from it. It is not good. Nor is it for our good. John in verse 16 outlines these three different areas. 
This is the first one. Desires of the flesh. These are the things of the world that do not come from the Father. These are the things that the world wants to offer us that make it seem like this is for our good. This is the best thing for you. Pursue this and you will find fill in the blank. Happiness, satisfaction, fulfillment, contentment, a partner, money, riches, possessions. I said money twice. Tough crowd, huh? (laughs) Desires of the flesh. Indulging in what is not good or overindulging in what God made. So it looks a bunch of different ways, right? The first part of that is what we would call sin. Our sinful broken natures because of what happened in Genesis 3. Long for things that are not good. That God calls bad. Things like stealing. When I was 14 or 15, I taught myself how to uh, pick a lock off of YouTube. I never used it to actually break into places. I just wanted to know how to do it. 15-year-olds, just whatever. But I remember having a pretty mean streak of really being into Yu-Gi-Oh cards, if you know what those were, and going down to the local convenience store and applying my five-finger discount. That's sin. We know that. That's stealing. We can give a ton of examples about that, but I think you get the point. But overindulging what God made good. I picked that word overindulging for a very specific reason. A very easy example we can give to that is food. Now, there's a lot that goes into food. Hear me. This isn't a health and wellness, fitness. We're not, we're not getting into all that. But I'll tell you what can at least be very prevalent in my life. I eat a lot. If you spend enough time around me, you will realize I eat a lot. But when I decide to overindulge in what God made good, which is food, I become a glutton. That's sinful. That is me looking for, in a a plate of pasta or a bowl of rice, something to satisfy me more than just my stomach. Awkward as that may seem, we do that with more than just food. We do that with all the things that God has made good and so expect something out of them they were never meant to give us that we overindulge in them. It's because of our flesh. But we keep going. Desires of the eyes. Has anyone here ever owned a cat? Played with a cat? Seen a cat? Okay. We'll go with it. Apparently not a lot of cat people in the crowd. That's a, dogs, does any, everybody love dogs? All right, we're a dog church. Good to know. Hey, if you ever spend enough time around a cat, or you can just Google cat compilations on YouTube, you will find that cats like shiny things. Light reflecting off of a mirror, a shiny piece of jewelry, or they really like red laser pointers, if you can see my hand. Cats love red laser pointers. I grew up with two cats, and I had a red laser pointer, and whenever I would get bored, I would just find my cat, bring it into my room, and we would just do this off the walls and on the floor, and the cat would just go everywhere, right? Because it saw something it wanted. It was like, ooh, you know, perks its ears up, its tail gets a little ruffled, and just goes for it. We're cats. Whether you like cats or not, we're cats. The world dangles shiny things in front of us, and we're like, ooh, give me. We have a greedy and covetous nature. Desires of the eyes very much means the things we see that we say, I want that. I should have that. That should be mine. Why not? And the world's like, yeah, yeah, go for it, go for it. Unfortunately, there's a really dark side to this too. We end up wanting things like, I want a new car, or I want a new house, or I want things like that, that in and of themselves don't necessarily have to be bad. But the world tells us, do whatever you have to, to get that. And that's where things really turn sour. But the other way this looks dark is when we start to look and want and desire and crave things from a really negative, pessimistic perspective. Easy example. You could be sitting in a room like this, you could be going to the mall, you could be going to work, and you see somebody who you think is wearing a better outfit than you. Oh, I wish I had that outfit. Or you see somebody who has a body shape that you wish you had. Oh, I wish I looked like them. I wish my marriage was like theirs. I wish my kids behaved like their kids did, right? Moms with young kids watching this are in the room, or moms who don't have young kids anymore remember feeling that? Going to the playground, going to the store, going wherever. I wish my kids behaved like that. And the list goes on and on and on and on. But the world dangles these shiny things in front of us, this red laser pointer says, come and get it. And we are all too eager sometimes to be like, ooh, But then this next one gets interesting. Pride of life. If the first two have to do about what you can get, this one very much has to do with what do you have? 
What can you boast in? Look at my accomplishments. Look at my accolades. I have better schooling than that person. I make more money than that person. I look better. My hair is not as gray. I don't have as much blubber on me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or maybe my kids are more well-behaved than your kids. At least my kid doesn't eat glue or whatever. I don't know, just whatever thing that people get upset about. But this pride of life lies to us. The world's like, yeah, no, you are awesome. And sometimes you are. Hear me. I'm not like, boo, you all stink. Sometimes you are. But sometimes you believe you're so awesome, you decide to look at other people and go, I don't need you. And then you look up and you say, I definitely don't need you. And that's the pride of life. You can do it all on your own. Me and my kids like to walk around singing all by myself. You know, all by myself. You know that song? Yeah, we like to sing that around. My wife doesn't like it. We believe that all by myself. I can do it. But John tells us the things of the world are not from the Father. They're not good. They're not for your good. They're not. Time and time again, creation bows out to this idea that we live long enough, and trust me, you don't have to actually live very long. I know middle schoolers in this church who get this idea. You don't have to live very long to understand Man, the things they offer us are really junky in comparison. But it comes to the last part. The world with all its desires and promises are passing away. That's pretty much verbatim what John says at the beginning of verse 17 in our passage this morning. It's all passing away. If the world and its things are not from God, that means they don't come from the author of life. They don't come from the author of light. There's no way they could last. It's like when it's cold outside and you go to take a breath, it's there for a microsecond, and then it's gone. Or it's like sometimes I'll be sitting outside in the backyard, with my, either by myself or with my family, and I'll see a particular cloud, I'll see a leaf on a tree, lately it's been looking at the pollen. Yeah. And I'll look at it, <laughs> and the wind will take it, and I'll blink and it's gone. It's just gone. Right? The world and its desires are passing away. They were never meant to last. Never meant to last. They were never going to satisfy. They were never going to fulfill. They were never going to live up to the promises it was giving you. And sometimes we learn this the easy way, and sometimes we learn this the hard way. But again, John this morning, his warning is proactive. Don't buy into the lies that the world has something good for you. It just doesn't. It really doesn't. But that brings us to the promise. It says at the very tail end of verse 17, but to the one who does the will of the Father abides forever. Not a lot of words on a page to give us context as to what that promise is, but it is enough. And to keep things symmetrical, it has three parts too. Part one, when we choose to love the Father, His love is then in us. This also seems like another no-brainer kind of moment. But here's what I want you to do this morning. Stop. And read that sentence again. When we choose to love the Father, because this love we're talking about this morning is a commitment, his love is then in us. Jesus, in his final discourse to his apostles, speaks of a very different kind of love that exists in the difference between God always loving you and the love you then start to receive even on top of that when we start to love him back. Jesus points out this. It is a special, not an add-on, but another pool from which God waters our gardens from. When we choose to love the Father, His love is then in us. We then can go and do the things we were always called and meant to do. We are then operating, we like to talk about, out of a place that is not full of lies and darkness and death, which is what the world throws at us. And it feeds into this. When we choose to love the Father, we receive the good things of the Father. I don't get the things of the world anymore. I get love and joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Fruit of the Spirit. I get satisfaction. I get fulfillment. I get strength. I get comfort. I get guidance. I get the thing our souls have always been craving anyway, right? These are things, we can be honest, these aren't bad things to want. We just look for them in bad places. 
But we get that when we choose to love the Father. God is actually so merciful. We get them anyway, but we get them to a new extent, a deeper, further revelation and extent of this when we choose to love the Father back. When the love becomes not a one-way street anymore, but a two-way street, things change in a very powerful way. And when we choose to love the Father, we no longer survive, but thrive. Some of you might get this idea, and some of you may not. But it's the best thing I could think of to explain this reality. Have you ever met somebody who was in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, but they died at 20? You get what I mean? You ever meet somebody in the middle or later parts of life, but they've been dead for a long time? So often when we like to follow the ways of the world and to receive the things of the world and to be, once again, be put in darkness, we die. Emotionally, mentally, sometimes socially, sometimes financially, but definitely spiritually. And I don't just mean a death in the life to come. That's not what I mean. That's not what John's talking about in this passage necessarily, or at least what I'm talking about with this point. But we do die a death while we are still walking around. We are surviving. And I don't just mean when you have tough days and sometimes you put the kids in front of the TV or you decide not to work out or you decide that that bill isn't due today, I cannot look at it today, or that email really hurts, I don't want to respond to it yet, or my friends really stink, so I don't want to have to talk to them right now. That's not what I mean when I just say surviving. Hear me, we have days where we just kind of slug through it and we have to survive. But I'm talking about a rhythm, a whole lifestyle, a reality that is dead. It's just dead. So deeply entrenched with the lives of the world, you don't even know where life and light looks like, let alone where to find it. We survive. We die. But our age keeps going up. But in Jesus and in God, when we choose to love the Father, we no longer just survive. We thrive. We thrive. My wife, God bless her, loves to garden. She's always wanted a garden. We never were able to have a garden before we moved here. And starting last year and well into this year now, if you pop into our backyard, you see that she is well at hand gardening. Amen to that, whoever said that, for real. We, okay, now I'm at a tangent because I do that sometimes. We eat a lot of kale in my house. We just like kale, we're weird. My wife planted four, maybe five kale plants last summer, and those four or five kale plants gave us more kale than we could have eaten. And kale's expensive, guys. Like, we were literally giving it away at some point. And that was just kale. Like, wow, like she's kicking butt with this garden, and she always wanted it. But anyway... The amount of time and effort and work she puts into having this garden not only look good, but actually produce is astronomical. Pretty much every time she's outside, with or without the kids or with or without me, she's looking and tending at the garden. It takes constant care. But unless you garden yourself or you saw somebody do it, you wouldn't know about the pH balance in soil. I mean, who thinks about that? Or how many rocks is enough rocks? Is this rock too big or not? Is that a weed? Is it not? I don't know. We got to Google it. How do you get rid of it? Did I get all the roots? Which plants go next to each other? Can carrots grow next to potatoes? I don't know. She does. I don't. Right? There's actually a lot of work that goes into that. But she so tenderly loves this garden, it thrives. It thrives. And we receive the benefit of it, the, the harvest from it. When we choose to love the Father, we receive that which we could not do for ourselves and that which we could not find for ourselves, and we thrive. We don't live to however old we live and die 50 years before that. We thrive. We become beacons of light in a world that is mostly filled with zombies. And the world needs that. People in general, the nature, like nature as we understand it, but also the system we've talked about. It needs that. It needs to see that this is not a way of life. It's not a way of love. It's a way of death. And here's where we're going to end this morning. If you hear me share and talk about all of this and you wonder, yeah, but I mess up a lot. Yeah, but I don't 
choose the way of love. I don't choose the Father pretty consistently. Or maybe ever, if that's where you're at. It's a struggle. It's a fight. It's a, I have more bad days than good, or I just don't care, or I'm numb to it at this point. If you're that this morning, I have another story for you. My mother, when she was in Brazil, uh, did a lot of cleaning, and one of her first jobs when she came to America was a cleaning lady. My mother is exceptionally gifted at cleaning. When Michelle and I moved out of our first apartment and she came to help us clean, my landlord gave me back the security deposit and more because he said, I literally have never seen this apartment that clean since I've owned this building. My mother is good at cleaning. My mother is really good at, yeah, yeah, clap for my mom. She's really good at cleaning. She's really good at organizing. She wanted to watch that Marie Kondo show on Netflix and then couldn't because she was like, I'm better than her. Seriously. Love you, mom. But seriously. But my mom is gifted in these realms, and I am not nearly so gifted, but I definitely inherited her bug. And so every so often, to the chagrin of my wife and to the annoyance of my father and sister, we get into some phases where we like to throw stuff out. What we determine is junk. But it's her and I determining what is junk and not anybody else, which leads to the tension. But for any of you who like to throw out junk, you're going to understand this metaphor. And for any of you who don't, follow me. When you first start to spring clean or throw out junk, it can be kind of difficult, whatever perceived value you have on the thing you're trying to get rid of, or maybe you just don't want to go through the effort of it, and that's okay. It can be difficult at first, but there is a sweet release and a very beautiful freedom when you have done th- been done throwing out junk, and you take a breath and you go, there's more space now. There's more air now. There's more life now. There's more wherever. Just like my mom and I, throwing stuff out, it takes a little bit of muscle building. It takes a little bit of commitment. It takes a little bit of grace and a little bit of continually coming back to this idea that the more you clear out room in your life and you clear out the things of the world, it then becomes easier and easier, gracefully and powerfully by the love of Jesus, to love and choose the Father. While John paints us this picture as a very black and white, the reality of hitting those poles is very gray. But gray only because we live in the tension in the middle, like what keeps a kite in the air, the wind and you pulling on the string. We live in that tension in the middle. But the reality is the more and more every day we choose, the Father, I love you today. Jesus, I love you today. Would you show me how you love me today? The more and more it becomes easier to throw out the junk. So close your eyes for me. For those of you who feel like I labor so hard to choose the love of the Father, Jesus, I love you. I'm committed to you. I want to follow you. And sometimes I'm very bad at doing that. Would you pray with me now in your own heart, in your own head? Jesus, help me to choose you today. Help me to choose the love of the Father. For those of you who find yourself in the tension in the middle, wanting the love of the Father, but not sure you can make that commitment, not sure what it looks like, not sure if you're ready for it, would you pray, Jesus, would you love me today? Would you help me to choose to love the Father? For those of you who are downtrodden, for those of you who are numb, for those of you whose burdens are over-encompassing, for those of you who are wholly caught by the ways and the things of the world, even if you don't fully realize it, but you think that might be you, for those who do not want to just survive but thrive, for those of you who want a life with the God of life, with the God of light, with the advocate, with the one who teaches us what real love, emotion, commitment, and everything in between looks like, would you pray, Jesus, would you help me to choose to love the Father today? Would you love me today? 
Jesus, we want to be people who hear your warning. Not because we are scared of the warning, but because we know it comes from a Father who wants the best for us in Him and through Him. We want to live in your goodness. We want to live in the way of love. So would we hear that this morning, Jesus? And would we also remember the sermon title was a warning and a promise? That Jesus, when we have fellowship with you, that we are found in you, when our life is so tucked away in yours because of what you have done on the cross and what you have done through your Holy Spirit since then, we, we don't survive, we thrive. We abide, we have fellowship with you forever. Eternity doesn't start when we leave this mortal plane, it can start now. Jesus, help us to know, receive, and choose the love of the Father and to love the Father today.